evening and a warm welcome to the national news live on Channel I. I'm Dilanjali Ananda. Good evening, I'm Charity Vinaparaji and now let's go on to the headlines for tonight's news. Director General of Health Services informs the Secretary to the President that there are no obstacles to conduct the electoral process within health recommendations and guidelines. The final rites of late former Minister Arumugam Pundaman will be held on next Sunday in Hathi. Fifth Executive President and present Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa completes 50 years in Sri Lankan politics. Thunder showers expected to occur in many parts of the island. Trump threatens to regulate or shut down social media companies. For those in other stories in detail. The Director General of Health Services has informed the Secretary to the President that there are no obstacles to conduct the electoral process under the health recommendations and guidelines. The Attorney General Department has informed that relevant particulars in this regard have been submitted to the Supreme Court. Additional Solicitor General Nishara Jayaratne said that the Attorney General has submitted three complete reports on the collective steps taken by the government led by the President in containing and preventing the spread of COVID-19 pandemic in the country. Additional Solicitor General Nishara Jayaratne said that according to the State Intelligence Service report, after the 30th of April, excluding the Sri Lanka Navy's COVID-19 cluster, quarantine centers and hospitals, no new COVID-19 cases were reported from the community. She said that the content of the letter issued by the Director General of Health Services, Dr. Anil Jha Singha, to the Secretary to the President on May 20th, have been submitted to the Supreme Court. She further stated that the Director General of Health Services has further indicated that the COVID-19 pandemic has been successfully controlled in the country while the number of infections and deaths from COVID-19 are at low levels at present. Accordingly, she said that the Director General of Health Services has cited in his letters that guidelines to hold the elections based on health medical recommendations and maintaining social distancing can be facilitated and there are no obstacles for the future proceedings of the electoral process. She also said that the Epidemiology Unit at the Ministry of Health has submitted reports on the containment of COVID-19 in the country from 29th of January to 26th of May to the Supreme Court when presenting submissions on behalf of the Attorney General. She added that these reports have indicated that the spread of COVID-19 pandemic in the country has been contained and prevented. Therefore, there are no obstacles to conduct the electoral process. And meanwhile, President's Counsel Manohar de Silva informed the Supreme Court that no legal provisions exist to recall the Gazette notification issued by the President to dissolve the Parliament. He further informed that no legal provisions have been facilitated to conduct the general election within a period of three months from the date of the dissolution of the Parliament and to convene the new Parliament. President's Council Manohar de Silva, representing intervenient petitioner Professor Pandula and Agama, made these submissions when the fundamental rights petitions filed challenging the dates of the general election on June 20th and decisions made by the President to dissolve the Parliament were taken up for consideration for the seventh day of today. The petition have been considered before a five member judge bench led by Chief Justice Jayanta Jayasurya. President's Council Manohar de Silva reminded the court that the Supreme Court had informed the Election Commission on its authority to take an independent decision to allocate a date to hold the election. Accordingly, they pointed out that it is surprising for the Election Commission to request more time to declare a date to hold the election and to issue a preferential numbers under such circumstances. He alleged that an issue has erupted pertaining to the attempts taken by both Election Commission and petitioners to postpone the general election considering these facts. President's Council Udita Ulagaheva, representing an intervenient petitioner, pointed out several disparities in the facts cited in petitions filed by each petitioner. Further consideration of petitions was postponed till 10 a.m. tomorrow. The final right of former minister and leader of the Ceylon Workers' Congress, Arumugam Thundaman, will be held on a next Sunday at the Norwood Stadium in Hatton. The mortal remains of the late minister is laying at his residence in Bataramulla. Minister Thundaman, who was admitted to the Palangama Base Hospital over a sudden illness, passed away last night. 
Upon hearing the news on the sudden demise of the former minister, many ministers led by Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa arrived at the Talangama Base Hospital last night. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa said that he had a bigger aspiration over the well-being of the estate working communities. The Prime Minister said that the late minister was a good-hearted and honest politician who extremely cared for his constituents. <laughs> Minister Dr. Bandula Gunavardana said that the late minister was a leader who had won the heart and trust of all communities in the country. He said that one of his aspirations was to build a university for the children of the estate workers. Former parliamentarian Mahinda Ananda Aludgamaji said that the late minister discussed on the 1,000 rupees salary for the estate workers even one hour prior to his demise. Former parliamentarian Susri Premajayanta said that the late minister was a compassionate and honest leader who was still considered to be the leader of the estate worker communities at the previous provincial council elections. The mortal remains of the late minister Tundaman was placed at the private funeral parlour in Borella till 10 this morning. Subsequently, the remains were taken to the late minister's residence in Batramulla. The remains of the late minister expected to be taken to the parliamentary premises tomorrow. The mortal remains of the late minister will then be taken to the headquarters of the Ceylon Workers' Congress on 29th and will be kept at the premises until May 31st. President Gotabe Rajpaksha has expressed his condolences over the demise of former minister late Arbugam Thondaman. Issuing a message of condolences, the president has said that he was deeply saddened by the untimely demise of minister Arbugam Thondaman, who served his community with dedication for the economic and social well-being of the less privileged plantation workers. The president said that the late minister who had correctly identified the issues faced by the Tamil community dedicates his entire political career to find solutions for these concerns. The message of condolences issued by the president indicates that the late minister vehemently rejected the ideology for a separate state for the Tamil community amid various intimidations directed by the powerful terrorist organizations. The president has also said that late minister continuously carried forward the dedication shown by his grandfather to uplift the livelihood of the plantation community. The message of condolences issued by the president indicates that revolt incepted by late former minister Saumya Murthy and carried forward by late former minister Arbugam Thondaman has brought upon a better livelihood for the present day plantation communities. Late former Minister Arunigam Thundaman called on Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa yesterday. This was the final official duty carried out by the late minister. Prime Minister's office has said that late former Minister Arunigam Thundaman met with the Prime Minister to discuss on the issues pertaining to the estate workers' communities last evening. A proposal was handed over to the Prime Minister by late former Minister Arunugam Thundaman to resolve the housing issue of the plantation worker communities. In addition, the late former Minister had presented proposals on the issues pertaining to the health and the development of the schools and infrastructure facilities of the plantation worker communities. The Prime Minister presented the proposal and suggestions handed over by the late former Minister Arunugam Thundaman to the Cabinet of Ministers today. Fifth Executive President in Sri Lanka and current Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha completes 50 years in politics today. 
Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha was first elected to Parliament on May 17, 1970 as the youngest member of the Parliament at the age of 24. Engaging in a revolutionary political stance of sitting beginning, Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha was at the forefront to establish a government led by Sri Lanka Freedom Party, putting an end to a 17-year-old United National Party reign. Also, he voiced against tragedies occurred in the country during the period of 1987-1988. Towards his political life, he successfully held various ministerial positions, including Labour and Fisheries ministerial posts, and also as the leader of the position and the Prime Minister of the country. He was elected as the President of the country in 2005 and won the hearts and honour of the nation as a leader who ended 30 years of long brutal terrorism from the face to the country. With the advancement of democracy, the period between 2010 to 2015 period has been identified as an era which achieved a rapid development in the country. This period offered social democratic approaches to economic and social issues. The continuance of social welfare policies, a massive commitment to infrastructure development, strengthening and rural sector of the economy for the benefit of the future generations. He came through many decades of several service to the people, demonstrating an unfailing loyalty towards the nation and balding facing the rough and tumble of politics. He, honoring service towards the nation, paved the path for President Gautabe Rajapaksha to be victorious as presidential election. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha is the present leader of the Sri Lanka for the Jana Peribuna. Total number of recoveries in the country has increased up to 732 at present. 51 active COVID-19 patients were identified in the country today. Ministry of Health said that all detected patients were members of Sri Lanka Navy. A total of 137 confirmed COVID-19 patients were detected yesterday and 127 out of them were returnees from Kuwait and directed to the quarantine centers. 10 patients were members of Sri Lanka Navy. A total of 217 identified COVID-19 cases were returnees from Kuwait. Director General of Health Services Consultant Dr. Anil Jasinghe at a press briefing this evening said that PCR tests have been completed to recovering total group of returnees from Kuwait. Dr. Anil Jasinghe further said that the government has taken steps to enhance the treatment capacity of COVID-19 patients by allocating Old Pildeni Hospital and Old Hambantut Hospital for this purpose. He also said that the COVID-19 cluster within the Navy is gradually being decreased. Total number of over 3,000 people related to COVID-19 cluster, uh, the Navy cluster rather, have been completed the quarantine process, he added. Dr. Anil Jasinghe has further said that the Navy cluster can be termed as controlled. He said all the necessary details related to the COVID-19 control activities can be obtained and downloaded from several websites related to the Health Ministry. Minister Pavitra Vanyarachi at the same press conference reiterated the steps taken by the government to avoid the transmission of COVID-19 from the Sri Lankan returnees to the general public. She further said that it is the duty of the government to bring back Sri Lankans who are stranded in various countries due to various reasons. The government used its enhanced sector of international relations for this purpose. A report issued by the epidemiology unit at 10 a.m. today has indicated that 20 COVID-19 patients have been discharged. A report issued by the epidemiology unit at 10 a.m. today has indicated that 20 COVID-19 patients have been discharged from hospitals after completely recovering 
from the disease in this last 24 hours. Accordingly, 336 patients out of the total number of 1,370 of COVID-19 infected patients have been identified as returnees from foreign countries. The total number of 725 confirmed cases in the country identified as members of Sri Lanka Navy and their close contacts. And meanwhile, the World Health Organization says the testing of the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine as a possible treatment for coronavirus has been halted due to safety fears. Trials in several countries are being temporarily suspended as a precaution, the agency said recently. According to WHO chief of the medical journal, The Lancet published an observational study on hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and its effect on COVID-19 patients that have been hospitalized. The Lancet study involved 96,000 coronavirus patients. Nearly 15,000 of the patients were given hydroxychloroquine or related from chloroquine either along with an antibiotic. The authors of the study reported that among patients receiving the drug, they estimated a higher mortality rate. The WHO chief said that the executive group of the solidarity trial representing 10 of the participating countries has agreed to review a comprehensive analysis and a critical appraisal of all evidence available globally. WHO initiated the solidarity trial, a plan to evaluate the safety and efficacy of four drugs and drug combinations against COVID-19 more than two months ago, which includes hydroxychloroquine. The death rates of the treated groups were 18% on hydroxychloroquine, while chloroquine or chloroquine in combination with antibiotic had an even higher death rate. Accordingly, the researchers have warned that hydroxychloroquine should not be used outside of clinical trials. South Korea reported the highest daily number of new coronavirus cases in 49 days as one of the country's largest e-commerce companies battled as an outbreak linked to a now-closed logistics facility. The country has reported 40 new cases, bringing the country's total number to 11,265. A day earlier, the country recorded 19 new cases. More than 2 million children returned to class in South Korea Wednesday despite a spike in new coronavirus cases. Tuesday marked the highest daily number of new infections in well over a month. The country reported 40 new cases as of midnight and 19 the day before. That came as one of the country's biggest online retailers, Coupang, battles an outbreak at a logistics center west of Seoul. At least 36 recent cases have been linked to it, though it was unclear how many of those were reported in the last day. The center is now shuttered. While South Korea has been lauded for its quick and effective response to the pandemic, Wednesday's numbers are among a recent resurgence of cases. It sparked fears of a second wave of infections. The first case at the Kupang Center was diagnosed on Saturday. There is suspicion it's connected to an outbreak earlier this month at a nightclub in Seoul's Itaewon neighborhood. The country's vice health minister, Kim Kong Lip, warned Wednesday that cases linked to the logistics center may rise. We are very nervous about community infections and we are keeping a close eye on the situation. We're doing our best to prevent the further spread of infection through fast contact tracing and testing. Kim says authorities suspect the Kupang Center did not comply with, quote, basic quarantine principles and say an investigation is underway. However, a company spokesman said the center went through daily disinfection. All employees wore masks and gloves and had their temperatures checked. A slow march back to normal seaboard spirits on Wall Streets as the floor of the New York Stock Exchange partially reopened yesterday since being closed more than two months ago and investors focused on green shoots of economic activity and news of the race for a COVID-19 vaccine. The famed New York Stock Exchange was back in business Tuesday after the iconic trading floor had been shut down since March 23rd. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo rang the opening bell to mark the partial reopening, bringing back the NYSE's practice of inviting a special guest to kick off the trading day. Of course, with one notable difference, he was wearing a mask. The governor wasn't the only one. All those returning to the iconic NYSE will have to wear face coverings and practice social distancing, which means only a quarter of the people normally on the trading floor will return for now. Later at his daily press briefing held Tuesday at the NYSE, 
Cuomo highlighted the reopening as a blueprint for other businesses looking to hit the restart button. Now, the British author J.K. Rowling has surprised fans with the announcement of a brand new children's book which she is publishing in daily installments on her website for free. The Icobog is the first children's story written over a decade ago for her own children and has now dusted it off. She has dedicated the book for children on lockdown or even those back at school during these strange, unsettling times. She enchanted millions of the young and young at heart with her Harry Potter books. Now author J.K. Rowling is to publish a free fairy tale online for children to read during lockdown. The standalone story called The Ichabog was written more than 10 years ago. Rowling said until recently the only people who'd heard the story were her two younger children. The mostly handwritten manuscript had been stored in her attic until a few weeks ago and she said she'd rewritten some parts in recent weeks. Rowling said the book will be published chapter by chapter to its own special website, which is due to go live on Tuesday, adding that she hopes children on lockdown, or even those back at school during what she called strange, unsettling times, can enjoy it. Meanwhile, Brett Carpets, the lifeblood of movie, premieres in award shows. Five on the buzz of glamour actors shoving stop stopping gong and screaming fans. Grappled with the coronavirus pandemic, the red carpet of the near future will look very different as Hollywood considers way to make red carpet events suitable for social distancing. It's the pinnacle of glitz and glamour, the red carpet, the lifeblood of movie premieres and award shows. A-list actors, show-stopping gowns and screaming fans. But in an era of widespread social distancing, the red carpets of the near future will need to look very different. So how would that work exactly? We don't have a crystal ball. God, I wish I, I wish we did, right? Um, I don't know what it's going to feel like. That's such a, it's a very glamorous side of this industry. I'm not scared of people, <laughs> you know, so you know, I'm like, when they open up, I'll be there. Chris Gardner from The Hollywood Reporter. Maybe when, a red car when red carpets do come back, um, there's plexiglass uh, barriers between the talent and the journalists, um, like you're seeing in supermarkets uh, across the country, um, just to separate um, people and, and accommodate social distancing. And couture may be paired with a new accessory. The people that I'm speaking to also say that masks uh, on, on red carpets will be common. I don't know. I don't know that we'll see, you know, you know, Emmy nominated actresses walking the Emmy red carpet wearing masks, but I do think that for some people, maybe photographers, um, everyone will be covered in masks. Mike Zimmett runs a New York based security company and he's unsure if actors will even turn up to events at all. I know one uh, certain talent I'm protecting right now is staying away from everything he will not go to an event unless the situation is right to enter. And I think that's going to be a lot of talent. Walt Disney and Warner Brothers are slated for major film releases in the summer but have yet to comment on their publicity plans. There's also been no announcement from organisers of the Emmy Awards in September. New Health Commissioner of India to Sri Lanka Gopal Bhagla says that the government of India led by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Singh Modi appreciated the Sri Lankan President and the Prime Minister for the steps taken to prevent the COVID-19 outbreak in the country. The High Commissioner Gopal Bhagla conveyed the good wishes of the Indian leadership when called on Prime Minister Mahindraj Paksha at Temple Trace this morning. Further discussions were held to deepen India-Sri Lanka bilateral economic relations and also to expand their close cooperation. 
During the meeting, the Indian High Commissioner reiterated the commitment of India to stand shoulder to shoulder with Sri Lanka in addressing the challenges posed by COVID-19 and in post-COVID economic recovery. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksha recalled the long-standing relationship with the people and government of India. He reiterated his belief and the bilateral relationships would become stronger with the addition of new areas of cooperation. He agreed with the High Commissioner Gopal Bagley that they shared Buddhist heritage and links between India and Sri Lanka, provide a platform for robust people-to-people -people engagement and for bringing the two people closer together. He said that he would instruct the relevant officials to consult with the High Commission to further develop such cooperation. The multi-storied housing complex consists of 152 apartments built at Slave Island Railway Street with the aim to provide proper housing for the families living in settlement in Colombo City was rested with the public today. The project was initiated by Urban Development Authority. The multi-storied housing complex has been named as Lakeside Residencies. The first phase of the housing complex implemented through a Pakistan investment company was constructed in a land acquired from the Railways Department in 2013. Forty new official residences were built instead of 28 existing official quarters and handed over to the Railways Department in 2015. A new mosque, a new Islamic religious educational school and community center replacing the existing mosque and Islamic religious educational school were also built at the site. The site also consists of supermarkets and relevant facilities. The new housing complex was vested with the public by Secretary to the Urban Development, Water Supply and Housing Facilities Ministry, Priyad Bandovikama. The project was completed at a cost of 1,100 million rupees. The project was initiated under the instructions of then Secretary to the State Defense and Urban Development Minister, Ministry President Gotabe Rajapaksa, under the program to build 50,000 housing units for the families living in settlements with less facilities in Colombo City. And meanwhile, the Bed Department says that prevailing showery condition is expected to enhance due to the low-level atmospheric disturbance in the vicinity of Sri Lanka. The Bed Department says that showers or thunder showers will occur at times in western Sabragamur, central, northwestern and southern provinces. Heavy rains above 150 millimeters can be expected at some places in western Sabragamur and southern provinces. Showers or thunder showers will occur at several parts in eastern and Uwa provinces and in Polonaru and Bulatev districts after 2 p.m. Winds will be southwesterly and wind speed will be 30 to 40 kilometers per hour in sea areas around the island. Wind speed can be increased up to 50 to 55 kilometers per hour at times in the deep and shallow sea areas of coast extending from Bulatiu to Kankasanthure via Mena and in Gaul to Batiklo via Hambantota. Sea areas of the coast extending from Bena to Potoville via Colombo, Gaul and Hambantota can be rough at times and swell waves may be experienced 2 to 2.5 meters height at times. Many low railing areas in Bulat Singhala have been inundated due to the heavy showers. The water level of the Karen River increased slightly this afternoon due to the heavy rains in upper catchment areas. Roads and low-line areas in Sri Tamaka Division were inundated due to the overline flowing of Vakwe. Consequently, many paddy fields and cultivation have been destroyed. 43 houses in Valiveria Gampa have been partially damaged due to the strong wind condition prevailed this morning. Many low-lying areas in Gampa district have also been inundated while vehicular movement have been hindered as many roads were inundated as well. Meanwhile, vehicular movement on Karadina Road in Getahatta Ahaliyagudav is hindered after an earth mound has collapsed on the road. Many low-lying areas including Nakandwala, Nikaswala, Erapola, Divrum, Pitya have also been inundated due to the prevailing weather condition in the country. Also, a flood situation has occurred in many uh, areas including uh, Hinidunga. Uh, this year we have been working very hard from month of April and uh, we did all the planning because this time we'll have to have the uh, safety centers uh, in conjunction with Corona and uh, Dengue uh, pandemics. So with that uh, I think it, is a, it was a serious scenario that we had to work very hard. So we are working with health authorities from the beginning and uh, uh, initially, from the Ministry of Health, we got a very good, uh, serious guideline and direction. On that guideline and direction, Disaster Management Centre, together with uh, Med Department, NBRO, and uh, Disaster Relief Centre, 
uh, with the advice of the Ministry of Defence and the Secretary of Defence, worked out all our plans. And we walked and we went into all the districts and uh, certain areas, important areas, and we spoke to them. We had uh, this.